you found your way to the Winning Tactics Podcast with host Adam Sinkis. Adam discusses winning tactics with small business owners and entrepreneurs, uncovering processes and introducing the tools and solutions for enhancing the bottom line. Thanks again for finding your way to the Winning Tactics Podcast and now your host, Adam Sinkis. What is going on, everybody? Happy Thursday for the LinkedIn crowd, y'all. We'll have to catch this on the replay. We'll make sure we get it up on video uh, on Thursday as well. Uh, but we are having some technical issues. But we are live on Twitch and Facebook tonight. So Twitch is my new platform. Trying it out there. Going to be uh, one of the first business-oriented shows in the Twitch network. So... Uh, we'll see what happens with it. But uh, I'm excited today. We have guest James uh, Robliota. I think I butchered that just just right for you. Uh, before we jump into James, I am going to. Uh, I would love to announce our sponsor for the episode: Cowork Hub Virtual, giving consultants, for, uh, coaches, freelancers, solopreneurs a sense of place in a remote work world. Uh, really awesome, awesome space. It is a virtual co-working space. It is all the advantages of having a co-working space, such as community access to people, uh, you know, that that you wouldn't normally have access to as a as a consultant or coach or a freelancer. Uh, that sense of going to a place, but it's all done virtually. It's 2020 friendly, as I call it. Uh, absolutely awesome. Go check them out. CoworkHubVirtual.com great place. Uh, hit me up if you have any questions on that. Uh, and without further ado, James, welcome to the show. So glad to have you on today. We are going to dive into uh, vulnerability and leadership, which I think is something that is colossally overlooked in leadership, especially with young leaders. So welcome to the show. Tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Adam, pumped to be here, brother. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Uh, so yeah, my name is James Robolata, or however you want to say it, really. I don't care. I'm not picky. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, we, we'll get there eventually. Um, I haven't, it took me years to say it right, too. So, uh, but I am a professional speaker. I'm an author. I wrote a book called Leading Imperfectly. And uh, I'm also a, a podcast host myself. I host a podcast called Diner Talks with James. Fantastic. Well, welcome to the show. Let's dive right into it. Really want to get into uh, how vulnerability builds trust, because I think this is interesting, right? Um, so many leaders I talk to in, in my past and in, in training young leaders, they're like, I'm the boss. You got to listen to me. This is this is my show. I'm right all the time. And, you know, it and it really builds such a negative culture. <laughs> Right. Um, so what are your thoughts on, on being a little more vulnerable in, 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 as a leader? Uh, how does that build your team up? Yeah, for sure. You know, I think we as humans can't learn things from people who are perfect. We can only learn things from people who are imperfect. And so it's in those imperfections that we start to build a really valuable tool in a leader's, in a leader's belt, which is that relatability piece, right? When we can see ourselves in someone else, we believe that we can. Um, and so that idea of relatability and how that yields itself or kind of, I should say, parlays itself into vulnerability is critical for leaders, in my opinion, because vulnerability, vulnerability is exactly what you were just talking about, brother. It's where it's where trust lies, right? Vulnerability, uh, when, when we have the opportunity and a leader shares a story, a time where they slipped, a time where they struggled, a time where they didn't exactly do the right thing and had a ripple effect that they didn't intend. When a leader shares a story like that, with a point on the end of it, uh, it actually causes individuals to see them as a little bit more human, a little bit more approachable, a little bit more, oh, so maybe this is an environment, this team, this company is a place where I can try, is a place where I can uh, fail, is a place where I can win, right? It kind of opens those doors when a leader is a little bit more vulnerable. And so that, that's where I've seen it really building more trust. I love how you you talk about stories because stories I think are a great way for people to learn. But you 
you very clearly said it has to have a point on the end of it. And, yeah, yeah, and I sure. love that because I have, I, I've worked for, for leaders that just like to tell old war stories. <laughs> and at, at a certain point in time, it's like, all right, I, I'm done with this. I've heard this story like six times mm -hmm. and it's always a little bit different, but it's the same story. <laughs> yeah, <know>? exactly. <laughs> and, and what it ultimately does, especially if it's a point where they slipped, ultimately it begins to make me question their judgment. Mm. So when you tie that point into it, I think that that's a really important thing. When you tie that lesson into the back end of the story, now it, go, it yeah. makes me go, well, yeah, he's told the story, but he's tying it into this lesson that's relevant to now that showed how he overcame that or she overcame that. Yeah, you got to land the plane, right? Uh, vulnerability for the sake of vulnerability isn't isn't effective. It's not a good tool. It's not healthy either, right? Like you're not supposed to walk into a meeting and be like, I got something to say, uh, <laughs> right? Like that's not, that's not what we're trying to do here. Uh, Brene Brown talks a lot about that and how vulnerability is not, you shouldn't, uh, vulnerability for the sake of vulnerability is not actually vulnerability. It's more of an attention seeking measure. Um, yeah. And so you have to be able to land the plane for individuals as to here's why this matters. But the thing is, is that, I mean, uh, one thing I've seen a lot, Adam, is I see a lot of leaders who they think they're practicing vulnerability when they're actually only saying the phrase, I mess up all the time over and <laughs> over again, right? It's like, yeah. there still has to be the story. You got to tell me where you were, what your thought process was, what your intentions were, but then what the impact was, and then what you learned from it, right? Um, and so that, that arc really helps individuals be like, okay, wow, I can see myself. Yeah, I'm, I'm here or I'm there or I can, see, uh, I can see exactly what I'm supposed to take away from that moment. Yeah. I think another interesting thing to point out is a lot of times leaders circle all their vulnerability stories into something that happens at work specifically, mm -hmm. whether it be this current job, their last job, uh, when they were a, an agent or an individual contributor on the team, yeah. you know, like they always seem to, in the onset, bring in these stories that are just strictly work related. Mm -hmm. um, do you see value in bringing in your outside experiences, things that happen, you know, maybe not like personally with your family, like you don't have to divulge the whole world, but, you know, like things that you've experienced outside of work in, in your personal life? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I'm, I'm a fan of that. Uh, but then again, that's the side that I often err on the side of as well, right? Like uh, in, in the realm of going from being a boss who only cares about team performance to being a friend who only cares about team dynamics, I err on the side of friend, right? We know great leaders are kind of right in the middle there. Um, yeah. But uh, so I err towards the friend side because I believe those relationships matter. I don't go all the way over there because that then it gets inappropriate. Um, and also there has to be, uh, there's a lack of credibility sometimes all the way over there. But uh, I think, I think, yes, bringing in those lessons. I mean, we've learned lessons from so many things, right? I mean, if that wasn't an applicable strategy, then why do, why do companies bring in football coaches? Why do we bring in uh, Olympic medalists? Why do we bring ballerinas in, right? Like there is so much applicable uh, and, and, and tangible knowledge that can be gained from a metaphor or uh, something that's adjacent. And I think it's another way just to hit the point. Yeah, no, couldn't agree more. Um, yeah, I often use... Uh, especially like in my LinkedIn posts and things like that. Uh, I use all the time uh, personal stories, things that happened. I watched my son bowl uh, his first ever 600 series in bowling, which for those of you that aren't bowlers, wow. uh, that is, it, it's, he was 17 years old at the time. That is a heck of an accomplishment. Um, that's kind of the first stage of becoming a really good bowler. So, um, you know, so I use those types of lessons because I think there's a lot to be said for those types of lessons in the workplace. And the other thing that uh, that really you know drives it home for me is when you bring in those personal stories, we start talking about true, real emotion, mm, yes. right? Um, and I think that's a big piece of vulnerability. What is your thoughts on uh, you know 
your your personal emotion when you're when you're involved with your team and you trying to connect with your team. Yeah, definitely. I, I think there I think there's a place for it. Um, I don't think it's uh, you can't come in and be absolutely raw <laughs> at all moments in time. I think there is a balance, um, and it's interesting because. I think there's a double standard often in leadership between men and women, uh, where uh, you know, where where men are taught from an early age that we're supposed to kind of keep our emotions like a sound wave in this pocket right here. I right? never get too crazy or too depressed or too this or too that. Um, and it's interesting. Um, because that's what men are taught. And then whenever we are around somebody who does experience more emotions and or is actually in touch with themselves, a novel concept, um, <laughs> then, uh, you know, oftentimes we hold that person back or we say they're dramatic when really that's just sexist. Um, and so mm-hmm. it's interesting when we think about this concept of, uh, when we think about this concept of where does emotion belong? I think Passion is one of the greatest drivers of individuals, right? It is a tool that many, many leaders have at their disposal. Um, and it is, I mean, sometimes we got to be the spark. We got to be the kick in the butt. We got to be the whatever it is. And so that's what I love about, like you were saying, like sharing some of those personal stories where like, hey, here's a time where I had to confront my friend. And that's even, sometimes it's even harder than confronting a coworker, but like I knew it was the right thing to do. And so let me share that story. Or here's a time, a, a conversation that my partner and I had. And, or, or we could also come up with hypotheticals, right? Like <laughs> or whatnot if we have to. But those stories, I agree with you. I think they're super powerful and, uh, and they definitely have a place in the teachings and in the, in the rallying of teams. One of the things that always has intrigued me about emotion, and it goes on on the premise that this is a foundation in sales, right? People don't buy from companies, they buy from people. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I, I think you can carry that along in when you're talking about connecting with your team as well too, right? Because at the end of the day, your team has to buy into how you operate as a leader and what needs to be done for the business. Yeah, And so ultimately you're selling, here's the strategy and here's the work that we need to get done, you know? And so, you know, I think connecting with people, connecting with your team in an emotional level um, really helps to drive that. Yeah. So how do you approach connecting with people on an emotional level and remaining appropriate, right? So we don't go into that, mm-hmm. that bad zone you're talking about, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but we also, you know, don't live in that I'm a robot that just, you know, gets the numbers for the company world either. Yeah, right. Just living in that black and white space. Yeah, for sure. I mean, rapport is critical. Um, And I I know I myself as a leader, I want to always be seen as approachable. Um, And so we can't get to approachable if we haven't established some sort of rapport, right? I want you to be able to walk into my door and tell me, yo, I just got a big win or, hey, something may have just happened um, and we need to talk about it. Um, And so uh, creating that is critical. And so what are the ways to do it? I think one is being authentically curious, right? I mean, we all know you can fake the steps to active listening, right? I can nod my head while you're talking. I can paraphrase what you just said. I can practice good eye contact. I can do all of those things, but it's hard to fake caring when you've made the decision to care. Mm -hmm. And so that is the choice, right? I mean, something that 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 I often talk about is like when we think about the role of love in leadership, and that's a dangerous word, but I'll say it. We're talking about vulnerability. We might as well drop the L bomb. Um, And so, uh, but we think about love and leadership. It's often like that uh, investment plus commitment equals love and leadership. And so where are you giving them the time? Where are you investing in who they are and where they want to go at work, but also investing in like, hey, how are your kids doing? Right. Uh, you know, you're, you're, you're like for you, Adam, right? Like it's like, oh, you know, your, your son's a big bowler. That's incredible. Has he had any matches recently? I don't even know if they're called matches, but I'm out here trying, Adam. And, uh, you know, like those kind of things where asking some of those questions is great, but it also just can't be I'm going to ask you all the questions and share nothing. Because then it feels a little bit weird. Like you also have to share a little bit of something as well. Finding those commonalities, it's 
uh, I often uh, I often think that like if I ever meet somebody who likes applesauce as much as I like applesauce, I'm immediately like, this is probably a good person with good values, right? Um, but like, what is your applesauce with that individual? What is the little thing where it's like, hey, we both like this thing, or we both like this music, or we both care about this sport, or we, uh, you know, finding some of those moments are are important because those are the moments of like you like you mentioned earlier. It's not hello robot. It's hello fellow human. Yeah, I. So one thing I used to do uh, with, with the very first team that I that I actually managed, um, yeah. I figured this out really quickly because I was floundering because I was there to change a bunch of stuff. So mm -hmm. I was floundering because I'm like, here, we need to do this, this and this. I was that robot. Um, but I started consciously, I would get up from my desk at I, I literally had a half an hour blacked out on my calendar every day. I would get up from my desk and I would go walk around to every person on the team and personally say, hello, good morning. Is there anything I can help you with? You know, whatever was relevant to the day. And like that little thing in the course of three weeks, by doing that every day in the course of three weeks, I went from being the enemy to them coming to me going, hey, I know we're trying to solve this. And this is my idea for it. Oh, wow. Yeah. You proved to them that you were an advocate, right? Advocate, right. ally. Yeah. What a what an amazing dynamic to create. And it, even now, um, it's kind of funny. I, I took a hiatus from that company and now I came back to the company and a couple of the, the old team are still with the company and emailed them and I got big, long emails back from them. Like, you know, like, it was just yesterday that I was, I was over that team and that, you know, that in itself is really powerful because that shows me that how, how we connected on an emotional level. Yeah. yeah. I that's, think the kind of bond that, that's the kind of bond that lasts for a long time. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's always this constant battle. One of my favorite movies is a Bronx tale. I'm not sure if you've seen it before, but uh, it's a classic Chaz Palminteri, mafia sixties movie. Right. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> and there's a point where, uh, where the main character, this kid is talking to the mob boss and asks him, you know, would you rather be love or feared? Um, and the mob boss says, well, I'd rather be feared because it lasts longer. Um, <clears throat> but the kid has to make a choice of like, well, I think, I don't think that's me. I think, I mean, cause, cause you're now living in a place where you can no longer trust anybody. You yourself mm -hmm. are also fearful of everybody. Um, but you know, what you were just talking about is that idea of I'm a lead with love. I'm a lead with, uh, with trust, um, and, and companionship. I think that's awesome. Yeah. I, I think it's interesting cause it leads me into something that, that always drives me nuts, right? You, you hear it at companies all over the place, leaders to, say these words and, and I just cringe every time I hear them. I have an open door policy. Yes, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Should apparently, I not first? <laughs> <laughs> apparently you share the same opinion of those, those words as, as I do. Oh, yeah. um, you know, and it's interesting because I hear it, but I don't believe it. Mm -hmm. And I, what are your thoughts on, on why why people I, and I know a ton of people, you know, personally that I've talked to that that have said those the, that exact same sentiment? I hear it, but I don't believe it, or they never show it, right? What what is your thoughts on that, and how does a leader correct that? Sure, I mean, I think vulnerability uh, is something that is is uh, is felt, not heard. Right, um, like, because I mean, anybody can you can you can technically stand in front of me and tell me a really deep personal story, but if you tell it like a robot, like it didn't impact you, the whole time I'm going to be like, what's happening right now? Right, like, why does this sound so weird? Like, are you this? You should have more emotion than you're feeling right now. Do we need to talk? Do you want to lay down? Um, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, vulnerability is felt. Um, and so uh, it's it's creating that feeling around the around the team. And so I mean, a lot of that stuff's lip service, right? Um, it's mm -hmm. just like, yeah, for sure. It's the same. It's the same. We know all of the phrases that people talk about. Though I messed up all the time. Oh, I have an open door policy. Oh, I care about this. Oh, I care about that. It's like, yeah, well, 
where you're, how you're fiscally responding to these things is not actually showing that you care about it, right? Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's 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 an interesting place to be. And I think for leaders to combat that, it's tough because the thing with vulnerability, authentic leadership, things like that, uh, the things that they have going against them is time. It takes more time to build rapport. It takes more time to build trust. It takes more time, right? Um, yeah. And and that's not something that a lot of people are interested in committing to, is that idea of like, all right, let's, okay. Because, because when somebody else messes up, that equals more work for other people and it's inefficient. Uh, but we know that authentic leadership, when truly practiced, creates efficiency on the back end far yeah. more efficiency than on the front end. And so you've got to be willing to put in the work to build the team to actually open the door um, and to invite people in, right? Sometimes sometimes you got to put the Cheerios out. <laughs> be like, no, I'm serious. Come on, uh, right? <laughs> not just not just the candy bowl uh, on the desk, but, you know, that kind of thing where it's like, hey, you know, let's have a conversation. I want this office to feel like a place where we can have dialogue where we can debate, where we can agree, where we can disagree. I don't want this to feel like the principal's office where you got to sit on the bench outside until I, I say your name and you got to come crawling in. Um, and so how are you establishing that kind of environment from an early place? Yeah, you know, I think time is time is really the, the big factor there, right? You know, it's, I liken it to marketing, right? Because essentially you're marketing yourself as, as being an advocate for the team. Yep. Right. And, and so there's this big fallacy that if I turn on my marketing today, it's automatically there. Well, you know, the reality says you know, anybody that knows marketing, SEO takes typically three to six months to really get going. You're, you, if you put a web, web page out today, three to six months down the road, that's really when you're going to really start to see it turn. You'll see a little bit of trickle here and there, but it's going to it takes time and mm -hmm. So many people are so unwilling to invest the time into making the change. And yes, you know, it, and you, you pointed it out perfectly and it takes, it takes so little to destroy it, but it takes so much to build it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> One of my favorite quotes is from my buddy's grandfather, um, his name is Norman Sellers, uh, co a complete no one to everyone here. Um, just, literally just my buddy's grandfather. But he says, he told me, he's like, James, everybody likes change. Everybody likes the idea of change until they have to do something about it. Right. <clears throat> and like, it's true. Like everybody is like, oh, yeah, oh, we got to change. We got to change. And then all of a sudden people are like, oh, hang on a second. Why does change feel a lot like work? I don't, know, I don't know. I didn't agree to work. I agreed to change. Like as a, as a, this isn't for me. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it, it's exactly right. It, and so uh, the other thing you pointed out is you talked about when you're inviting people into your office, it's a place where they can agree. It's also a place where they can disagree. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really powerful. I think, um, I think people are afraid so often to disagree with leaders because that's the environment uh and bear with us just a moment he's having a little bit of technical difficulty we'll get him back here but we're talking about vulnerability and in, in disagreeing with your leader and i think there's a really appropriate time and place uh to do that it, and it's okay it's, it's truly okay to disagree Yes. Um, as long as it's done in the right context. What is your thoughts on inviting disagreement? Yeah, for sure. I mean, <laughs> this is this is the question that our country needs to answer, right? <laughs> is what does having a <laughs> what does having a civil conversation look like anymore, right? Especially when this comes to social media, we're just yelling at each other, and mainly we're yelling at people who agree with us, which is interesting. Um, and it's a lot of I know, right? I know, right? Um, and uh, and it's it's a fascinating world uh, that is starting to shift away from being able to have a conversation in person where we disagree, uh, and that is such a powerful tool uh, because. When we're able to disagree, it actually takes pressure off of leaders because if we can't, like, it takes pressure off of them of having to be perfect, 
right? Of like, oh, sure, I got to have it all figured out. I got I to make everybody happy at all times, right? And things like cancel culture, right? Like that kind of stuff. It just, it puts so much pressure on individuals and it's not effective. Um, and, uh, and, and so inviting individuals to be able to disagree with you is critical, but it's also hard because it turns out it's nice to be right. It's nice. It's, you know, right? Like it turns out like validation is a really beautiful drug that I suggest to most people. Um, and it turns out that our egos are a thing. Um, and so it takes a strong individual to be like, let me, let me listen some more. Right. Let me ask one more question as opposed to jumping in with my thoughts, jumping in with my gut reaction, my reflex, my defensiveness. Anytime we feel that sense of defensiveness, I think we need to ask one more question before we open our mouths and share something. That's a great reflex yeah. in marriages. That's a great reflex uh, in, uh, in friendships and things like that as well. Right. That idea of like, let's ask before we advise. Um, and I think that's, I think that's where it comes in a little bit of that idea of we can disagree, but I want to learn more about where it's coming from for you, especially when we think about things like feedback, right? Feedback is often a growth conversations are often difficult and they're uncomfortable. They're like, I got to get this over with, but they don't have to be uncomfortable. If we start with questions, as opposed to start with, here's what you did wrong, right? Like a lot of times. Sometimes the issue isn't that they didn't do the, they didn't do, it's not, the issue is not that they did something wrong. It's that they didn't understand the expectations that were set for them, right? The power of clarity in leadership uh, is critical. And so I think some of those kind of things, I would say, all fold into this idea of allowing disagreement, right? It's just the same thing. Like leaders need to take responsibility when, when they are wrong or when they said something a little bit off or they said something, right? Like, it doesn't have to get as complicated as it's gotten. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I think it's interesting because I think we are we're we're ingrained, like you said, you know, as humans, we want to be right, you know. Mm-hmm. But I think power. The I think back to the most powerful leaders that I had, and they actually taught me how to disagree mm. by setting clear expectations. It's it's something that was wildly interesting to me. And especially as I look back on it and as I've gained knowledge around it, right? Yeah. But, you know, and it's something I carried into teams that I've led as well, going, I don't have to be right. I don't have to have all the answers. But if you come to me with an idea, here's what I need so that we can constructively, you know, deal with that. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. and a, lot, a lot of times it's, you know, in, in the business world, it's coming with data. Show me the proof that, that your concept your, why you think your way is better than mine or, or whatever it might be. Show me proof, uh, proof of concept that it does work. Yeah. Right? If you just come and say you're wrong, that's not healthy for anybody. But if you come yeah. and say, you know what, we've been doing it this way, but I found if I do, if I flip the pages in this order, mm-hmm. I can get through three more claims per hour. Cool. You have data that shows me that that proof concept that that works. It's much easier at that point than to agree or have a healthy conversation about it. You know, because I presentation. Yeah, I completely agree. You know, you said something pretty powerful earlier, and I I love to hear more about it because it was intriguing to me that your 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 uh, your your previous supervisors kind of taught you how to disagree, what, like how, how do they do that? Do they do it basic kind of what you were just saying? Um, is, yeah. is, is, did you pass that same thing on? Or that was passed yeah. on to you and that's how you did it? Yep, that's exactly that. That's how they all approached it. It was very consistent with, mm-hmm. the, with the really good leaders that I had. It was always consistent. You know, when you come, you know, we sat down and really built out expectations for each other, right? And yeah. so, by having a clear set of expectations, I knew what they wanted when I came to them. I knew what they wanted when they came to me, mm-hmm. you know? And so like by doing that, we were able to disagree very effectively. That's powerful. So. Yeah. And there's a respect to that, right? I mean, 
We respect individuals that we can have tough conversations with and still like pat each other on the back afterwards or grab a beer or like, oh yeah, you know, right? It doesn't yep. just have to be about like sports teams or something like that where it's like, oh, you're a Yankees fan. Hey, you're this fan, whatever, whatever, right? Like it can also come down to core beliefs of like, oh, this is this is how I think this should be done. This is how I think it should be done. This is uh, this is how who I think should lead the country. This is who I think should lead the country. Cool. I respect it if you come with an informed decision, um, yep. right? And not just that you heard some things and popped off. <laughs> yeah, no, it, 100%. And I think it kind of leads into our last topic for, for our conversation today, which is the value of being wrong. And we've alluded to it several times throughout this conversation. But, um, you know, as a leader, I actually, I love being proved wrong. <laughs> I do. I, I jones on it all the time. You know, I, I think the fallacy is that a lot of leaders come to the table when they're, especially when they're new leaders, right? And they come to the table and they've had a string of bad bosses. I think everybody's had had bad bosses in their career mm -hmm. um, that, have, that have ingrained this behavior that I have to be right 100% of the time or, yeah. you know, but the reality is, as a leader, I'm far more disconnected from the process than anybody doing the work. I might be good at it. I might know what that process is, but I am disconnected from it. I'm doing far other different things. Yeah. And so when somebody says you're wrong, I'm like, cool. Why am I wrong? <laughs> I get excited. Yeah. And they, it confuses most people. <laughs> he seems genuinely happy. Should we check on Adam? Is he good? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's so much power in, 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 in being wrong and being okay with being wrong. And I love that you talked about specifically with new leaders, right? Because we know that as a new leader, you're like, all right, get my chops wet here. Here we go. New hire, about to prove them right. Just got my bachelor of science, um, right? Like, And uh, it, it's, it's fascinating because a lot of individuals need to remember that they were hired not because they were the most perfect, but instead because they were the most trusted, right? But mm -hmm. we put this, this idea of perfection of, I can't be wrong. If I'm wrong, that means I'm gonna have this ripped away from me and this was part of my plan and don't ruin my plan, um, right? And, uh, and don't cut me down, as opposed to recognizing that you were trusted to not get it right all the time, but when you don't get it right, to admit it, and to figure out what we need to do to get back on track, right? Like you were trusted to be resilient, to be nimble. Um, and that is, that's a space that I'd rather live in as a new leader, as opposed to the one where it's like, I have to be perfect. I must prove myself. I am bearing the family crest, right? <laughs> like, like that kind of stuff. Um, I, I agree with you. And I think there is a lot of fun in being proved wrong uh, if you're ready for it. Um, sometimes, right. It can, it can catch you off guard. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> right. Like sometimes it'll catch you off guard. And, uh, I don't know, like, I think there, there is a mindset that we need to recognize. Uh, and, and I think a question that I ask myself a lot of times when I go into feedback conversations, whether no matter which side I'm on is how am I showing up to this meeting? Yeah. Right, let me do a quick check before I even put my hand on the doorknob real quick. Pulse check, how am I showing up to them? Am I showing up super defensive? Am I showing up like, all right, buckle up. I got stats and sheets and I'm gonna show you a thing or two. Or am I showing up being like, yeah, I'm a piece of garbage and I deserve everything that's about to get thrown at me. I'm kind of worthless, right? Like, how are you walking in to the room that you're about to walk into is important, right? Because that energy is gonna carry through. Um, and then your ability to actually listen in that moment will be dictated by how you showed up. Yeah, that's really interesting to me because I, I've taught leaders about posture, right? And, mm -hmm. and how they address in like coaching and things like that. You know, and it's the, the arms crossed, the sitting yeah. facing my computer thing, right? You know, I usually, I, I used to teach a, a module that, uh, and, and I would send them out for break. And when they came back in from break, I would do like the ultimate lounge, like as far slouched as you could possibly get in the chair. I was there. Yeah. Right. And, and I just set, set the piece of paper, the, the lesson plan on my chest. Like I was like totally like chilling, like ready for a nap. Yeah. Right. 
And I and they'd all come in and sit down, and I just start like lackadaisically like teaching the next section. <laughs> <laughs> and they look at me like I'm nuts. I'm like, and then I'd stand back up because I I'm I'm I can't teach from a chair. I I walk around the room and. Uh, you know, I stand, I stand back up. I get my posture situated. I get the paper right. I, I get all situated. And I go, what did you guys think about that last lesson? <laughs> <laughs> and, and nobody ever says anything, but they all just kind of stare at you awkwardly. Like, <laughs> I go, here's the real lesson. Yeah. You know? But it likens the point to what you're saying about just showing up in the right mindset mentality framework you know you don't want to show up to to give somebody serious disciplinary action and you know have a big old giddy smile on your face like you got just got done watching the latest jeff dunham special right yep exactly <laughs> you know <laughs> and, and and so that in itself i think sets the tone and then when you walk in the room and and have that healthy discussion it opens you up emotionally to be prepared, like you're saying, to be prepared to be wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or just be prepared to be like and engage in a dialogue, right? Like, because we, sometimes we do need to pump ourselves up because we do need to also defend ourselves. Yep. Uh, and so what does that look like? It, how are you advocating for yourself on a daily, weekly basis as well? Because um, we know plenty of people that write stories in their heads of like, I'm not the right person for this job. I've been waiting for this moment. I knew I was just waiting for people to find out why did we hire him? Why did we hire her? Right. And that a lot of times we see individuals that live almost like in that imposter syndrome space. Yes. Um, <clears throat> where it's like, well, I'm not good enough, this enough, that enough. Um, and so let me just go in there and take my licks because I deserve it. You know, there are times where we also need to advocate for ourselves as well. And so it's a it's a constant battle. And I think always just doing a quick bring it back. What's happening inside of me right now? OK, I know that that's where I'm walking into this meeting from. So let me try to balance that out throughout the course of the meeting to make sure that I don't just come for somebody's throat or I don't just get walked all over. Yeah, no, I think that's interesting. I think even in being wrong, right, because. Mm -hmm. At that point, you are very clearly on the defensive now. Yeah. It, just human nature says that we are on the defensive when we're wrong. Mm -hmm. Even if you're standing, if even if you're me and you're standing there with a big old giddy smile, waiting for waiting for the forthcoming of of why you're wrong, um, you know, you have to emotionally prepare yourself for that moment because it's hard to hear mm -hmm. that you're wrong. You know, yeah. and, and so how do you how do you get into that headspace? Like once you realize that they have a valid point, how do you switch your mindset and get into that headspace so that you can effectively handle that? I'm wrong. Yeah. Yeah, that's tough. I think I mean, I think knowing your confrontation strategy and, and your confrontation go to's is important. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's kind of, it's almost like when you have a conversation with your partner, loved one, whoever you're, you know, maybe you're married to somebody or whatever. Um, it's a little bit like you have to communicate about how you communicate. It's not just like people like communication is key in a marriage. Communication is key in leadership. It's like, you're right, but that's a, that's a, <laughs> that's a cliche. So let's go a layer deeper, right? Let's, it's about communicating about how you like to communicate. And so, I think it's okay to ask yourself or ask for yourself in that moment of like, hey, this was a lot to hear. Could we schedule another follow-up meeting so I could take a beat and just take a second, um, right? Uh, and kind of those moments where I know sometimes with my wife, I'm like, I'm going to walk out of the room for a second, just for both of us, um, <laughs> right? And it's like, I'm just gonna take a second uh, because we will have a more productive conversation. And so knowing what you need is also important. Right, you don't automatically need to fold to the other person's style. That's where that's where we advocate for our communication preference, for our confrontation preference. Um, I think I think that's one way that we can prepare is remember that like 
I don't need to, I don't need to go in there and take my licks and get out of there. I can ask for a pause, ask for a beat. Um, even if it's just like in the moment, be like, I'm just going to jot a couple of notes down real quick before I speak, you know, whatever it is, um, knowing what you need in that moment so that you can show up correct as a way of like, Hey, this other person matters and I don't want to just come for them. Um, but at the same time, I also matter and I don't want to get run over. And so, uh, I think that's one of the ways that I would suggest doing it is kind of first being reflective about what is my confrontation style? Um, how have I been in the past when I've been called out? Um, and, uh, and what have I also seen from others when they've been called out? That kind of thing. Yeah, no, I absolutely love that. Uh, I'm a firm believer in the power of the pause. Yes. Right. It, it, as a trainer, we, we, I've been through so many training, self-development stuff, and, and every one of them talks about speaking with intentionality and understanding that a, a, a one to two second pause mm -hmm. is really not anything that anybody scoffs at. It feels like eons to you personally, but nobody else notices it really. Yeah. It just makes right. you sound way, way more intentional. And so I love that you called that out, that, that pause. You know, and the notes thing, that is gold. I, I'm totally going to steal that, by the way. <laughs> Start using that. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that's that's really, really powerful. So we are getting to the end of time. I want to uh, take a moment and wrap up with, and off, of, off of everything that we've talked about today, what's one thing that the audience can take away and action upon uh, to be a better, more vulnerable leader. Yeah. I think a lot of it comes down to listening. Um, and so often in this world, people are more interested in being right than what is right. I think it's hurting us. It's hurting us in leaders. It's hurting us in teams. It's hurting us as a society. Um, and I think in general, uh, thinking about that, am I, am I more interested in being right right now or am I more interested in what is right? Um, and if I'm more interested in what is right, then I need to be a little bit more vulnerable, right? It, it's interesting. Vulnerability is not just you opening your mouth. It's also being vulnerable, allowing yourself, your ears to open to hear things that may make you uncomfortable, right? That somebody's life is different than yours or something happened and you know, it was interpreted a different way that intent and impact are not the same thing. Um, and so, uh, so I think that is one of the biggest things that we can do is, is thinking about uh, that moment uh, because that vulnerability, both in what you are sharing and how you are listening is what creates that moment of connection. Awesome. Absolutely love that. I appreciate everything that we've talked about. We totally ran over on time and it is awesome because I am super it. passionate about it. I knew it was going to happen. I, I absolutely knew it was going to happen. But most importantly, where can people find you? Yeah, absolutely. I am James T. Robo. Uh, R-O-B-O, James T. Robo, all over the internet, social media, Instagram, uh, obviously on LinkedIn here, James Robolata. Feel free to check me out there. My podcast is called Diner Talks with James. It's about the late night conversations that we have with friends that we never want to leave over food we shouldn't be eating. Um, and uh, yeah, and I've been doing a whole lot of speaking in the virtual world as well. And so that's why it's so special to get to come on here. Adam, I love, I love your podcast. I love your show. Uh, and it's just an honor to get to talk to you for a while, brother. Thank you. Awesome. Appreciate you. As always, uh, you can find us on all the podcast networks. We are on all the major podcast networks. Hit us up on YouTube, the Winning Tactics Podcast, LinkedIn, Facebook. Uh, we toy at Twitter and we toy at some of those other platforms, but there are only so many time, so much time in the day. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, you can find me on LinkedIn as well, Adam Sinkus. Uh, and all over the internet, just Google search my name. I take up like five pages. Uh, wonderful having everybody on the show today. We had uh, we had a few people listening live. We'll definitely get some others catching the replay action. We appreciate you. We will see you next week. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. Well, that wraps up yet another episode of the Winning Tactics Podcast. 
You can find Adam on both the LinkedIn and Facebook platforms. And to support the show and ensure the success of the podcast, would you kindly consider visiting Patreon forward slash Adam Sinkus? We greatly appreciate it. And until next time, from the Winning Tactics podcast, remember, culture is how your team behaves when no one is looking. Take good care and thanks for listening.